So imagine yourself. You were able to speak to a baby in a mother's womb. What would you talk about? Well, there's three things I think I would like to talk about. The first of all, do you know you have a mother? Now, you haven't seen her, perhaps haven't heard about her, but um, she's the reason for your existence. And in her, you live and move and have your whole being. If it wasn't for her, you wouldn't have been. The other thing I would like to talk to you about is life after birth. There's a life beyond your imagination, your wildest imagination. And I wouldn't be able to explain it to you. I don't know where to start and what to tell you about that life. It's just far better and more than what you've experienced up to now. And then the last thing is, you will only enter this life through pain, through a pelvic thrust of your mother, through tears, through blood, you will enter into this new life. But you'll be able to meet your mother soon after this experience. Everything will be forgotten. Um, she actually prepared a place for you. Can't wait for that moment to meet you and to share life with you. Friends, I can't help but to think that this might be a very good metaphor for what John is trying to do to people that live in persecution. It's the first time in the history at the end of the first century where the Roman emperor decided to intentionally, strategically scapegoat Christians and started with a persecution. So Christians lost their jobs. Some of them were made slaves. Families broke up. They lost everything they have. And some of them were martyred to death. It's a terrible time to live in. But John's got this message for them. And it's not an a, a idea that would only help them to feel better. He's sharing reality with them. And his message is Jesus. And he says, I want to give you a revelation of Jesus, of who he is, what he's done. And he's busy doing something at this moment that you might not be aware of. And I want you, uh, the, you to believe it. I want you to trust in it. And he is going to do something beyond your wildest imagination. And he wants to share it with him. And his ideas was the seed for the faith confession of the church. The apostolicum, because uh, cause the Christians got together and said, okay, just before we die, let's make sure what are we dying for? And they came up with four basic ideas that we believe in God, the Father, the Almighty Creator. We believe in Jesus, the Son of God. He, he suffered, he died, but he was resurrected from the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the community of the saints. And we believe in the resurrection of the dead. And we believe in eternal life. That's what we are dying for. So, let's take a moment and just look at this message of John. For the life that is to come. Well, he says that at this moment you are actually experiencing pain. But it's like the birth pangs of a mother. And it, that's what death is. Death is, uh, is sorrow, is painful. But do you know what will happen? You will receive a new life. And it would be a continuation of the life you have now. Um, now, verse 3 you are the house of God and God is with you. Uh, verse 7, you will, be, you, will, you will be forever the house of God and God will never leave you. You will always be. It's a continuation. But on the other side, 
it, it will be perfect. It will change. It will be healed. He says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's what will happen to you. A continuation, but it would be beyond your imagination, what you could ever think and dream of. Um, two things about this perfection. Well, first of all, perfection does not mean um, the same. It does not mean you, it, everything would be the same, everybody would be the same. It still means diversity. For he that makes it. For he that overcomes, um, I will give him everything. And, and he said in 2.17, I will give him a stone, a white stone with his name written on it. And it would be a name that only he knew, knows about. And only I will know. It, was, it would be something that only we would share together. In other words... The uniqueness that we experience now, although we are all children of God, would continue. And just as a father and a mother would have a different type of relationship with every one of their children, so God will have a unique, different relationship with you. Although we are all with Him, we are all His children. Your uniqueness will come to fruition and you will blossom and you will become totally you that's what will happen and the other thing is that this life is not something static but it's dynamic we're not going back to eden it's not a reset button and back to how it originally was um, um, jesus says i'm doing something new look at it i'm doing it at this moment But the tense he uses in the Greek, and you can pick it up in the English, I'm busy doing it and I will continue to do this. I will make everything new. So um, perfection actually means a paradox to be on your way to perfection, to not really reach it. That's the type of perfection, because that's the nature of God, ever evolving. Um, Becoming larger, bigger, into a newness of things. Now, Talart de Jodeau was a scientist. He spoke a lot about Christ and creation and, and his fellow academic friends sometimes critiqued him because they said, you're actually mixing empirical scientific research with non-scientific ideas of spirituality, which is not an exact science, and you cannot bring this together. And Talat disagreed with him. Uh, but Talat was also a priest, a uh, Jesuit priest, and he had some troubles with the church, and the church he had to defend himself. And they, they asked him, but how can you talk about atoms and molecules and, and Jesus in the same sentence? Uh, what are you doing? And he said, I'm actually trying to tell you something that the apostles believed and that you will see and read in the, our faith confession in the apostolicum. And that's the fact that Jesus did not only die to save our souls and so that we, our souls can go in, to heaven. There is going to be a resurrection of the dead. Jesus actually physically became a human being. He died and he was raised physically. He is the firstborn from the dead. Revelation 1.5. There's going to be a second and a third and a fourth. And what happened to him is actually the start and the beginning of 
everything that are restored by God. Um, he, say, he said we make a big mistake to think that uh, we are something separate from creation. We are only the part of creation that became self-conscious. Because the atoms, the molecules that you'll find in the ground, that you would find in the stars, that you would find in trees and animals, are exactly the same in our human bodies. And he said, yes, the miracle, the miracle of the resurrection is as big as the miracle of creation. Because in creation, God created atoms. And atoms started moving and connecting with each other. And that's how molecules come into being. And the molecules started connecting with each other. And that is how cells come into being. And that is how living organisms come into being. And that's how plants, animals, humans come into being. So how it actually happened, we're not on the same page how it actually happened, but this is what, no matter what you think, the reality of existence, of everything that you can touch and see and feel. And he said, on the day of the resurrection, the atoms moved. Something new happened that has never happened before in history. It's the beginning because the earth as we know it is, is groaning, is dying just as humanity and God, and the only way we can be saved is from the outside. God will come and he will make everything new. That is our Christian hope. And that is what we are living for. Um, th the life now, John says, is um, look. God's home is now amongst his people. You will live with them and they will be his people. Look, I'm making everything new. And just think back about your life. You came into this world and you grew. Lots of things happened to you. And suddenly you could see, smell, hear. Uh, you received your mother tongue and you started ordering experiences and a consciousness came into being. And you evolved. You've met people. You've experienced what it means to, to fall in love and to love somebody, to give and to forgive. And grace so much happened to you. And it is still evolving. It's still growing and there's an explosion of discoveries of the inner world, psych psychologically and socially. We've, we've, we've discovered that um, the cognitive dimension of our development, the emotional aspect of our being and development, the moral development, the social, the self-identity, the values, there are so many and what we know today is that you might sometimes grow in one aspect, and I'm sure you've met somebody that is very clever and knows a lot cognitively, but emotionally or socially is like a little child. And he's not living to his full potential yet. And the old church father, Irenaeus, said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And for a lot of us, there's so much more to this life that we are experiencing at this moment. But then there's a dimension of life that you can experience now. It's, it's, it's like beyond the imagination of somebody that's not been born yet. You can now be born again. And what it means is that you can now become aware of your mother. You can now meet your mother. And you can now have a, a, a life with your mother and get to know your mother. It can happen now to you. So more than the physical, more than the emotional, and the world of the ideas and the soul, you, there's a spirit, a heart that can be born again. And you will look at life totally different in the core of your consciousness, would be God. It's given to you in a moment, but you grow into the rest of your life. And that's a 
big world that you can grow. Jesus lived this way. You know, when, when he, uh, he suffered on his way to the cross, and, and you look at what he's going through, what he went through, I'm amazed at the fact that he, he wasn't in reaction. He wasn't reactive. He never cursed or, or blamed anybody. He could have. His own disciples, where were they? The, the religious establishment, you know, the high priest or, or the, the government officials, Herod. You know, that's a, he was a Jew. And then Pilate, who said he's innocent, but went on to let him be crucified. He called everything that happened to him the cup that my father has given me to drink. I've got to go through this. On the other side, there's the promise of a new life. It's a total different consciousness to go through life. It's larger. When you look at the lilies of the field, it's more than a scientific look. You know, it's more than, oh, uh, what does this plant consist of? How does it, it's more than the eye of an artist. It's beautiful. It is through the eyes and consciousness of the creator that's giving this lily life at this moment that made it. Look at the diversity of everything. He made everything. How clever, how imaginative he must have been. And he's given it for me to see, to look and to share it and the joy with him. Jesus said, if you are able to look at nature this way, it will have an emotional effect on you. You'll be less anxious, less worried about things happening in your life. Everything in your life changes. Your identity is more. There's a depth dimension. I'm not who people say say I am. I'm not what uh, what my gifts are. I'm not the role that I'm fulfilling at the moment. I'm much more. You know, the place is much more than location. To love is much more than an emotion, more than a sentiment. It's much more than um, uh, uh, appreciation for things that people are giving me. Time is is, is much more than the duration of time. It's much more than chronos. My destiny, it's much more than the fulfillment of my goals. Life becomes something totally different. This is the hope that we can live with. Now, there's so much more about my life with God that I haven't explored yet. I can grow. I can experience so much more. Uh, It's the difference between a two-year-old and an 18-year-old that can happen to me now. I can experience. But in the life to come, There's so much more. I cannot imagine it. Now, if we work together, say for instance, at a certain place, and it's not a nice place, it's a difficult work, but we've got this promise that at the end of this year, your dream will become true. What's your dream? You know, perhaps it's to be healed. Perhaps it's a relationship that that, that you want to have with somebody. Perhaps it's just to have 10 million bucks or whatever it is. How do you think? Would you look at what's happening to you and how would you experience the difficulties? If you haven't got that dream, how can you? You know, Viktor Frankl said, if you have a why, you can handle any what in life. I want to close with a a dialogue that I read a discussion between two people that were in wheelchairs. Both of them through accidents that happened to them. The one is a very famous um, actor, and the other one was actually a medical doctor. And the actor was known for his um, positivity. You know, he, he was known for his optimism and the energy that he just had in a wheelchair. And they said, how can it be? And he said, well, because I believe any moment I can stand up, any moment I can find a cure for my situation. And that's what's keep me going. That's every day that I wake up, I say to myself, 
this might be the day. Uh, the doctor disagreed with him and said, that's not hope. That's wishing. And that's wishful thinking. And actually, it's very harmful. It's harmful to other people like me uh, that's, that's got to sp- because the reality is we've got to spend the rest of our lives in a world. One out of 10 million will stand up and through unexplainable reasons and walk again. But we cannot build our lives on that dream. We should face the fact that we, should, we are going to spend our lives in a wheelchair. It will prepare us better for a life in a wheelchair. And it would help us, you know, to, to not be disappointed and give up on life later on in life. And when I read it, I thought, the one I would describe as an optimist. And the other one, perhaps, as a realist. You know? And who's right? You know, what would be the best way to go through life? And I can see the same thing happening with us as Christians. You know, you get the very optimistic Christians that says the kingdom of God has come. We don't have to be sick anymore. We are healed and, and, we, can, and we can have heaven now. You know, of course, experience is something else. But I say you should just believe. You know, like, like the famous actor that actually died hoping that he would stand up. And that's what faith is like. Just keep on believing that it will happen to you. Um, on the other side, we've got the realists. They say that the kingdom of God will come one day. Now it's pain. And, and we've just got to hold on and hope for heaven one day. Who's right? What should our attitude be? I wonder where the invitation is not for us to be more optimistic and at the same time to be more realistic. Not to have, to have a, a better balance between the two. Of course, we would not only get out of our wheelchairs one day, we will run. And the prophet Isaiah said, we will fly. That's so it's much more optimistic, but also much more realistic. Uh, being in a wheelchair is not our biggest problem. There's something wrong with our souls, with our inside. Um, and, and, and we're invited to embrace reality and to live with us into what God has for us. So where are you at this stage in life? Perhaps you're living in verse 4. There's death. There's loss, there's tears, there's pain, there's suffering, there's sorrow that I've got to meet in this life, at this moment. No. And for jo- John would say, can I tell you about Jesus? Can I tell you about the life that you can experience now with him? Uh, it will blow your mind. But can I tell you about even something even bigger, death? Death is not the end. It's the birth of a life beyond your wildest imagination. We can only say and live with the words of, um, of somebody that said, All shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of thing shall be well. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the life that you've given us. And um, we, we, we th- ask you, Lord, to help us to see what we can be now. Help us to be fully human, fully alive. And help us to trust in you and what happened to you is going to happen to us and to the life beyond our wildest dreams imagination that is to come. In the name of Jesus, amen. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.